Good morning and welcome to the Design Science Association live streamed meeting. We're just getting started and as a test, is our audio working? We have a uh, monitoring audience monitoring this to report back if everything is working. And okay, we can just assume it is because it'll take the Assuming that it is, we'll go ahead and get started with this month's live streamed Design Science Association okay. meeting. And in case anyone's wondering, I'm Mark Nelson, Design Science Association president. We have with us this morning Mr. Pat Rory speaking on mankind having been made in the image of God and some spiritual implications of that sounds very interesting. I wanted to mention very briefly before some announcements at the end, but very briefly, if you are not receiving our DSA newsletter by email, please sign up for it by writing us at Design Science Association at Gmail. That's one long word, Design Science Association at gmail.com, and you'll get on the list for receiving our newsletter some interesting announcements and a little article hopefully in there each month. So continuing on, Pat Roy spent 12 years as the radio producer at Creation, the Institute for Creation Research, continuing on there as their director of broadcast media. With his wife Sandy, they created the Jonathan Park Audio Adventure Series, a very popular series. Pat currently is the director of the Mount St. Helens Creation Center, and we are very thankful to have Pat speak to us this morning. Thank you, Pat. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, I'd like to start by uh, beginning in prayer. So uh, if you'll just uh, pray with me, that would be great. Dear Father, thank you so much for loving us. And uh, God, I just pray that uh, today as I speak, that uh, it would be helpful information. Um, Father, I pray that uh, we would do more than just hear about creation. But Father, I just pray that we would use that as a way to go out and uh, reach people, that you would use us as tools to change lives. Um, God, we just pray that uh, you would uh, use us for eternal things. We just pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, today I wanted to talk to you about uh, being made in the image of God. And uh, in Genesis 1.27, we read, in my opinion, one of the most amazing verses of all. And it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You know, I think we take that for granted all the time. But when you think about it, God was showing love. What does it mean to be made in God's image? Can you imagine the amount of love it took for God to make a creature that was actually designed in his image? I don't know about you, but I take that for granted all the time. But think about things like God does. Uh, we were created a little lower than the heavenly beings. It says that in Psalm 8, 5. 1 Corinthians 15, 39 says that man has one kind of flesh, animals have another, and birds and fish another. Bible says that we were not only created by God, but for God as well. So God has taken pleasure in us, right? He, he created us for fellowship. We can communicate with God. We can commune with God. We can worship God. We can know right from wrong. We can choose to follow God or to rebel. We can communicate with verbal and written language. We have an eternal soul. Uh, we're the ones that rebelled, right? Not the animals. And uh, all of creation was cursed as a result of that. And we're the ones who need redemption from, uh, via Christ's death on the cross. And we can praise the Lord with our heart. It is amazing what it means to be made in the image of God. And I like to think about how God has just shown his love to us through that. There's no other way that God could have shown his love in any other more amazing way than to make us in his image. And we are special creatures. And the God of the universe, the one who made it all, loves us. When you think about that, that is really incredible. I want you uh, just... I have a problem. I have an unexplainable problem. Okay. <laughs> the slides are coming. I'm just getting the first slide. Oh, okay. In the image of God. But this, this TV 
Okay. It's going. So stand by for technical issues. Do you want me to keep rolling as you fix it? No, because. <laughs> okay. I don't know what. It was just working a second ago. That's okay. I can continue on without slides if you want. Uh, Live broadcasts. <laughs> Who knew? Well, while you're doing that, um, you know, I go out to youth groups a lot, and I even ask that question. I ask them, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And uh, I ask the students, and I think a lot of Christian students don't know what that means. I don't think we think through that very much. Matter of fact, when you think about what students are learning in the public school system right now, um, they're learning that uh, they're nothing more than highly evolved animals. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of Christian students don't know what that means to be made in the image of God. Okay, let's test it. I think it might be working. Switch, okay. switch your slide back to that one. Okay. okay, it's working. Okay, great. You've got slides, yay, you can see what I'm seeing now. Anyway, my point is, is I think God showed his love by making us in his image. And then something horrible happened, right? Because God gave us the choice to follow him or do things our own way. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we read about the great rebellion, right? We decided that we were going to do our, our thing. We were going to do it our way and not God's way. And that's when a curse was placed on all of creation and uh, placed on humans as well, right? Is because we rebelled and decided to do things our way. And God gave us this incredible gift of being made in his image. And then we turned around and rebelled. You know, later on when uh, Jesus is talking, uh, later on in the New Testament, he's talking about the, uh, the devil, right? The enemy. You belong to your father, the devil. He was talking to the Pharisees. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. I think about this all the time. What would Satan hate the most about humans? It would be that we're made in the image of God. I think Satan hates that. And in the Bible, in uh, John 10.10, 10, uh, the first part of 10.10, 10, it says, the thief, talking about the, the devil, does, uh, does not come except for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We've got an enemy who wants to take us out, and he wants to convince us that we're not made in the image of God. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a, war, a, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so it's been thousands of years of this battle, uh, humans being made in God's image, Satan hating that, and trying to deceive and convince us that it's not true. And so I want to talk to you today about the world we live in, because more and more people are becoming deceived that we are not made in the image of God. Matter of fact, going back to Genesis 1:27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Well, I guess we could ask the question, which God, right? Uh, we ask that a lot of times. I've even seen bumper stickers that say, uh, uh, one nation under God, who's God? Also, uh, science has proven uh, that the Big Bang and evolution created us, right? What do you mean created? Uh, created man, well, that's a little misogynistic, isn't it? <laughs> when you think about it. Uh, his own image, well, it's my body, my rights. Uh, we don't belong to anybody. Um, what about this? Uh, we are nothing more than highly evolved animals, so we can c cut out the made in the image of God. Well, he, why do we naturally assume the authority figure to always be male, right? Well, male and female, well, we know that there's now uh, more uh, than 60 non-binary uh, non genders, right? So we can cut that out. And then, of course, we want to use proper pronouns, right? So that may not be the proper pronoun when it comes to referring to God. And, uh, you know, even the reference in Genesis, we know that uh, science has shown Genesis to be a fairy tale. So basically that leaves us with so. And that's kind of where we are in the world right now. And so I want to talk to you about what do we do as Christians, as creationists made in the image of God, and how do we share the love with people? Because it really does come down to love. If we truly love people, and if they're truly made in the image of God, we want to share that with them, right? And it's not that they're the enemy or it's us and them. It's more that because of love, we want to say, no, you are so much more than you know. You are made in the image of the Creator. And we want to show them love because of that.
And so today I want to talk about the battle against the image of God. You know, I know a lot of us have worked in different organizations where there's an org chart. I know I've been part of organizations where you've got the president and the vice president and then you've got all of the lines. And uh, we've all been in the situation, or at least a lot of us, probably where you've worked for an organization where somebody is not playing the proper role in the organization. Somebody's taking authority that isn't theirs, or maybe they're not doing their job, and it really kind of makes the whole uh, situation very hard to work in, and actually, it can actually destroy an organization if people are not following the proper lines of authority, right? And so we've all been there before. So here's the question, where do we fit into creation? Here's what I've noticed, is that Satan, in attacking the image of God, he deceives us into misunderstanding who we are in creation. That's really the lie that he, he gives us. So the, the first lie is that we are like gods. Matter of fact, we say, see that in Genesis 3, 5. For God knows that when you eat of it, talking about the, uh, the fruit that Eve uh, ate, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So that's the first way he tries to deceive us, is to think that we're more than we really are. Well, Mark mentioned that I used to work for the Institute for Creation Research, and many, many years ago, uh, we decided that we were going to put together an audio uh, for radio uh, broadcast, and also just an audio that people could buy, talking about the importance of uh, the creation message. And so they asked me to try and think through uh, how I would communicate that. And so as I began thinking, I thought, wow, it would be neat to actually go out and show the implications of the creation versus evolution worldview. And so I want to share with you some of the interviews that I did while I was there. Uh, the first one was uh, with Will Barron. Now, uh, Will Barron uh, has written a book called Deceived by the New Age. And Will used to be like a high priest of the New Age movement. They don't call it high priest, but that's kind of the role that he served. And when I interviewed him, I said, Will... What does the whole evolutionary idea and, uh, and the new age, what, uh, how do those go together? And he said, Pat, he said, we've been evolving physically for uh, hundreds of thousands of years or 100,000 years. He said, and now it's time for us to evolve spiritually. And eventually we'll all come together in this one spiritual conscience. And uh, so basically evolution is the whole idea behind the New Age beliefs, right? And so uh, we hear that a lot these days, is we hear that we're like gods, that someday we'll actually evolve to the place of, of being godlike, and that we are divine in our own nature. Matter of fact, here's another uh, gentleman. Um, this guy is uh, Eckhart Tolle, is a New Age spiritual leader, and uh, you can see what he says there. You are the universe expressing itself as a human for a little while. Wow, that's pretty radical. We're the universe. Here's another uh, gentleman uh, and Donald Walsh. And what he says is quantum physics tells us that nothing is observed. Nothing that is observed is affected by the observer. Unaffected by the observer. Okay, I'm going to start over again. Quantum physics tells us that nothing that is observed is unaffected by the observer. That statement from science holds an enormous and powerful insight. It means that everyone sees a different truth because everyone is creating what they see. Wow, that's pretty amazing, right? So we are creating uh, what we see. Amazing. All right, here's somebody else that I interviewed for the, uh, the project that I did. His name is Charles Spiegel. Um, unfortunately, he is deceased now, but he is the director of Unarius. And so uh, the Institute for Re Creation Research used to be down in San Diego. And so when they were in San Diego, just a few blocks away was a place called Unarius. And Unarius is this place where um, they teach that someday we're going to be united with our alien brothers. And so as I was doing my project, I was really praying about, Lord, who do you want me to interview to show how evolutionary ideas play themselves out in uh, the modern day world? And so I was driving along and I saw uh, the building, Unarius, and when you look at it, it's really an amazing building. There's these, uh, these uh, um, paintings on the outside and you see uh, pictures of spaceships and you see people reaching up to the spaceships and you see all the alien brothers and it's really amazing. It really stands out in San Diego as you drive along uh, through El Cajon is actually where it's at. And so I was thinking, I went, wow, that'd be really interesting to interview them. So I parked my car and I had my recorder and my microphone and all of that stuff. And I walked through the building and here's all these strange pictures. And I walked through the, through the door and uh, 
It was amazing. There was light, and all around were mannequins standing there. And there was a spaceship that was hanging from the ceiling. And again, the people were re reaching up to the, the ceiling, and uh, it was just an incredible uh, sight when I went in there. Well, I walked up to the, uh, the front counter, and I actually did this. I said, take me to your leader. <laughs> anyway, so the woman says, how can I help you? And I said, I said, listen, I would love to interview um, somebody connected with this place, just, uh, and I explained what the project was and everything. And she said, well, it'd be great if you could interview Charles Spiegel, who was the current director at that time. I said, that would be great. And she goes, well, he's not available, but uh, basically you'll need to meet him uh, sometime and interview him. So she set that up for me. Now, if you're uh, familiar with San Diego, there's a place down there called Mount Helix, and on Mount Helix is where all these big, huge mansions are. And so I was driving my little pickup with my microphone and my recorder. As I'm driving along, the mansions are getting kind of big and a little bit scary looking, right? And so I'm praying, dear Lord, please don't let it be one of these big scary mansions. And of course, by the time I got to the address, it was like one of the biggest, scariest mansions of all, right? So I parked my truck. And as I uh, get out and I'm walking down the driveway, he's got all of these, like, I don't know how to say it, crystal figurines and stuff in the driveway and just kind of uh, weird looking uh, objects and all of that type of stuff. And so I went up to the door and I kid you not, it had one of these. And I was expecting for the door to creak open and for him to go, come, come. But it wasn't like that at all. Fortunately, he was wearing a baseball cap and some blue jeans and a t-shirt and I went, Whew. So I walked into the foyer of his house and again, there was all of these like crystal structures. There was one I remember that was diamond shaped and it had like red that was uh, coming down and it was just a uh, kind of strange looking, but he seemed uh, completely friendly and just did a great job uh, being kind to me. Well, we walked into his, um, I guess it was his living room area and uh, it was really interesting. He had one of those magnetic um, 3D structures swirling around. I don't know if you remember those. Those used to be very popular for a while. And as we walked in, he said, Pat, as best I can describe it, this is the Unarius worldview. And I kid you not, as he said that, it went off the track and it literally went to pieces on the coffee table. And I so badly wanted to say something, but I was so shocked. I'm like trying to put it back together for me. He goes, no, no, just leave it there. So uh, I began the interview with him and I, I said, uh, Mr. Spiegel, I said, what does evolution have to do with your worldview? And he said, Pat, evolution is my worldview. He said, there are, um, evolution took place here on earth and it's also taken place throughout the universe. He said, there's so many civilizations all the way across the universe and they're all evolving. Uh, and just like we have been, uh, one of the scientists uh, speak to me and he said, Pat, here's what's going to happen is uh, there'll be a ball of light that hovers over my head and then uh, it'll go into my mouth and he goes, and then uh, one of the scientists from another planet will talk to you. Would you like to do that? Well, I said, you know what? It's so late. I got to run. And so I jumped in my pickup truck and I took off. But uh, the interesting thing about that uh, interview is I realized that the connection with all the extraterrestrial stuff and all of the aliens and all of that is based on that idea that mankind here on Earth isn't the one made uh, in God's image, but actually by evolution, and that that's been happening all across the universe. And so some of those are some of the things that we see happening now is there's a huge belief uh, that evolution has been taking place all throughout the the universe. The other thing that we see nowadays is extreme environmentalism, right? Now God said that we were supposed to be the stewards, right? So we're supposed to do a good job taking care of the earth, but we're not supposed to worship it. Matter of fact, in Romans 1, it says that uh, they worship the, uh, the creation instead of the creator. But we're supposed to worship the creator himself, but we are supposed to be good stewards, but we can't worship uh, the creation itself. Uh, check this out. This is a, 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 a quote from a, an evolutionist uh, a while back, but I just think, wow, when I read this, I see the thinking behind it, and I go, this is incredible. So this is a guy by the name of Jeremy Rifkin. Evolution is no longer viewed as a mindless affair, quite the opposite. And then the quote goes on to say, one eventually winds up with the idea of the universe as a mind and gives order and structure to all things.
We no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home and therefore obligated to make our behavior conform with a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. Uh, like the Bible? It's our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world. And because we do, we can no longer feel uh, beholden to outside forces like God. We no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are the architects of the universe. Wait, what? We are responsible for nothing outside of ourselves, for we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And then you know how he ends? He says amen, but I'm not going to say amen to that. Wow. That's the thinking. You know, if evolution is true, and there's been evolution for millions of years, and eventually we evolved up to the top, and now humans are the most intelligent thing on this planet, I can see how people get confused, right? As, as students are learning this in school and all of that and everything, uh, it starts to make sense, right? If we're the most intelligent thing on planet Earth, I guess it would be our duty to take care of the Earth and to try and figure it out. But here's the deal is as a creationist made in the image of God, we know that he's the one that's in control. Matter of fact, it says in Hebrews 1, 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the imprint of nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand uh, of the majesty on high. It's him that upholds the universe. It's not us. In fact, one of the favorite things that I got to do when I uh, was at uh, the Institute for Creation Research is I would interview a lot of the different scientists. I remember interviewing an atmospheric scientist as he was telling me about how when there's a hole in the ozone, there's a bunch of feedback signals that cause a bunch of different things to happen and it starts to repair the ozone again. Um, I've learned that uh, when it comes to the temperature of the earth, that the heat starts to heat up and then a bunch of feedback processes happen and all of a sudden it starts to kick back down again. And then once it starts getting too cold, a bunch of feedback uh, systems happen again and it starts to kick back up again. And so it's like a thermostat that's controlling the temperature of the earth. We've all heard about the, uh, the, the little organisms who eat oil in the ocean when there's an oil spill. And what you begin to realize is that God's got this. It's him that controls it all. It's not us. We're not the ones that are going to save the earth. It's God, the creator. And so we're called to be good stewards, but God is the one ultimately that upholds everything. It's him that takes care of it all. Here's something else I, uh, okay, so the other way is Satan likes to deceive us that we are like gods, but then the other way he does it is that he devalues life, that we really don't matter, that we have no purpose or meaning in life. Okay, Neil deGrasse Tyson, many of us are familiar with him. Um, he is an evolutionary um, scientist. And basically, he says that we are made of nothing more than stardust. What is the most astounding fact you can share with us about the universe? The most astounding fact. The most astounding fact is the knowledge that the atoms that comprise life on earth the atoms that make up the human body are traceable to the crucibles that cooked light elements into heavy elements in their core under extreme temperatures and pressures these stars the high mass ones among them went unstable in their later years they collapsed and then exploded scattering their enriched guts across the galaxy. Guts made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the fundamental ingredients of life itself. These ingredients become part of gas clouds that condense, collapse, form the next generation of solar systems, stars with orbiting planets. And those planets now have the ingredients for life itself. So that when I look up at the night sky, and I know that, yes, we are part of this universe, we are in this universe, but perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us. 
when I reflect on that fact, I look up. Many people feel small because they're small and the universe is big, but I feel big. Because my atoms came from those stars. There's a level of connectivity. That's really what you want in life. You want to feel connected. You want to feel relevant. You want to feel like a, you're a participant in the goings on of activities and events around you. That's precisely what we are, just by being alive. Wow. So we're nothing more than stardust? You know, a lot of people believe that. <laughs> and as Christians, as creationists, I think we want to reach people with love. And we want to say, no, you're not stardust. You're so much more than that. You're made in the image of God. You know, Charles Darwin said, there is no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental faculty. Wow. Ernst Haeckel, evolutionist ideas back in the 1800s. He was a zoologist, a naturalist, a eugenicist, wow, philosopher, physician, professor, marine biologist, and artist. And basically, he came up with an idea showing that a human baby in the womb was developing in the womb, that you uh, were a fish and then a salamander, a turtle, a chicken, a pig, a cow, a rabbit, and then eventually became a human. That is amazing. By the way, uh, during his time period, that was actually shown not to be true. Matter of fact, here's a quote by somebody. The procedure of Professor Heckel remains an irresponsible playing with the facts, even more dangerous than playing with words, uh, with words criticized earlier. So basically, clear back at that time, it was shown that he was a fraud. And nowadays, we know that it's not true because we can watch the whole developmental process, right? We can actually watch with cameras and see that a human is a human from the very beginning. We're not evolving in the womb. You know, that paved the path for people like uh, Margaret Sanger. The practice of birth control, and by birth control, she means... Uh, abortion, right, raises us to a higher stage in the evolution of life. As each individual progresses, he helps us to raise the human race as its evolution forward and onward to higher planes. Margaret Sanger was the uh, founder of Planned Parenthood. You know, during my project that I was telling you about, I got to interview Carol Everett. That God grabbed onto her heart and she became a Christian and she believed then that life begins at conception. And God is so amazing. He took this former abortion clinic owner and he turned into, into a pro-life speaker that has now traveled around the world speaking on behalf of the unborn. Well, I got to meet up with Carol and I got to interview her and I said, Carol, tell me how the evolutionary worldview fits with what you used to do as an abortion clinic operator. And she said, Pat, when a girl would come in and she was feeling a little nervous, we would tell her no reason to worry because that blob inside of your womb is nothing more than just a product of evolution and it's really not a human. And that was the basis for all of the horrible things that they did at the abortion clinics. Isn't it amazing though that God grabbed onto her heart and completely changed her around? We know what the Bible says about that, right? For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. See, we're not a little tiny blob in the womb. We're a creature uh, made in the image of God from the very beginning. You know, the other thing that we get to with uh, evolution is racism. Uh, the Aborigines at one time were actually being shot and their skulls and bones were being sent to museums because they felt that they were actually uh, an evolutionary missing link and so they studied them as that. Uh, there was one point where they were actually even put into zoos. Can you imagine putting humans into zoos? Here's a young lady by the name of uh, Creo. Um, she had a, a disease called uh, hypertrichosis, which uh, causes extreme hair growth. Um, at that time, she was uh, taken to a bunch of different uh, circuses and sideshows and all of that, and she was proclaimed as a missing link. And yet this young lady was very talented. She was musical, and uh, she had a very creative mind. And she was a creature made in the image of God, but she was peddled around uh, Europe to be shown as a missing link. And it's because of the Darwinian ideas. And it was Satan trying to take out that idea that we are made in the image of God. 
Here's another quote by Darwin. At some future period not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. Wow, Charles Darwin. Well, he was kind of predicting what was going to happen with uh, Hitler, right? Hitler, during one of his, uh, his speech in Nuremberg, said, The Germans were the higher race, destined for a glorious evolutionary future. For this reason, it was essential that the Jews should be segregated, otherwise mixed marriages would take place. Were this to happen, all nature's efforts to establish a, an evolutionary higher stage of being may thus be rendered futile. Well, we know where those ideas took him. Many, many thousands of people died as a result of his ideas. You know, I got to interview uh, Dr. Erwin Lutzer. Dr. Lutzer um, wrote a book called Hitler's Cross. And basically in there, he talks about how um, Hitler used to hold up Jewish skulls in their meetings and try and show how they weren't as highly evolved as the Aryan race. And so again, we see this, this battle as Satan is trying to convince people that they are not made in the image and he's devaluing them. You know, in our current day, we deal with critical race theory. This is something that's being taught to kids in schools all of the time. And basically, the idea is, is that uh, we uh, perpetuated some horrible crimes, which we did, right? There was horrible things in the past of this nation. But what they do is they say, now we need to make reparations for that. And, and students are being taught that now we've got to, it's almost like if you're not racist in some ways, you're actually like being racist. And it's so confusing and kids don't even know what to do with all that. Well, remember, evolution, if you're consistent, is always going to lead to racism. Now, let me back up. Not all evolutionists are racist, right? Matter of fact, maybe most of them aren't racist. But I would say if you believe that uh, different ethnic groups are evolving at different speeds in different ways, that ultimately, if they were consistent, they would be racist. Well, what about the Christian worldview? Well, are there racists who are Christians? Yeah, a lot. But if they were being consistent with the worldview, what God tells us is that we all come from the same family, right? That God says that we are all made in his image. We're all created equal. So if we as Christians are going to be consistent, we cannot be racist. We can't. But again, the evolutionary worldview, if it's consistent, ultimately has to lead to racism. And I'll tell you, I think we're facing these issues more than we've ever faced before in this nation. And it is being used to divide us and to break us apart. And as Christians, we need to have a solid foundation on what the scripture says, that all people are made in the image of God. We know the the account in the Bible, the Tower of Babel, we had the entire genome there at the Tower of Babel. We know that the languages were confused. That genome was broken up and different people moved to different areas. That's the explanation for, for where the different ethnic groups came from. But it tells us that we all came from the same place. We are all um, of one blood. Matter of fact, uh, it says that in Psalm 139, 13 through 14, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries, boundaries of their dwelling places. Okay, I don't want to hit this too hard, but uh, basically the other thing we're dealing with is the transgender movement right now. Uh, it says that God made us, created us in his image, male and female, and yet... Um, all kinds of students are now being taught that there are over six, 60 different uh, genders that they can identify with. And so basically they say that there's your sex assignment at the beginning of your life, but then after that you can choose from the many, many different flavors of uh, gen gender identity. And again, it's just coming against what it says in the scriptures of, so God created man in his image, the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Well, the other thing that we need to deal with right now is cancel culture. Here's, uh, here's uh, Dr. Krauss, uh, an evolutionist, and here uh, he talks about what he thinks about creation. It amazes me that people have pre-existing notions that defy the evidence of reality, but they, that they hold on to them so dearly. And one of them is the notion of creationism, or in fact, look, Senator Marco Rubio, who's presumably a reasonably intelligent man, and maybe even educated, was asked, what's the age of the Earth? 
And ultimately, either because he, he actually believed it or he, would, or he was trying to appeal to some constituency, had to argue that it's a big mystery, that somehow we should teach kids both ideas that the Earth is 6,000 years old and that it's 4.55 billion years old, which is what it is. If you think about that, somehow saying that, well, anything goes, we, you know, we shouldn't offend religious beliefs by requiring kids to know, to understand reality. That's child abuse. And if you think about it, teaching kids that the, or allowing the, the notion that the, the, that the earth is 6,000 years old to be promulgated in schools is like teaching kids that the distance across the United States is 17 feet. That's how big an error it is. Now you might say, look, a lot of people believe that, so don't we owe it to them to, to allow their views to be present in school? Well, as I've often said, the purpose of education is not to validate ignorance, but to overcome it. Wow. So if you're teaching your children that they're made in the image of God, that's child abuse. You know, the reason I play this video is we as creationists, we're involved in a battle. And the way we fight our battle is with truth and with love. In fact, John 8, 32 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When it comes to all these different issues, we need to love people, and we need to tell the truth, and we need to share with them that they're made in the image of God. I just want to, uh, to talk very quickly, returning back to the org chart. So where do we fit into creation? Are we like gods, or do we have no value? Well, the org chart of creation, in my opinion, is in Psalm 8. And it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast adorned, uh, ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and thy avenger. When I consider and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. To the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever patheth through the path of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all of the earth. You know, when we realize why God made us, and what our function is in creation, it's to serve him and to love him and bring him glory. What it does is it tells us that there's purpose in life. Well, I want to close just by um, saying it's important that we live our purpose. And just like we started this off, I think a lot of times as Christians, we feel like it's us uh, and them, and we battle it out and we try and win arguments. Uh, I know I've been guilty of that a lot of times, but really what I think it comes down to is the way we show love to people is we just simply say, you know what, God's got a purpose for you. You're not stardust. You're not some random chance accident that happened. You're not a result of the Big Bang. You're not a result of mutations and natural selection uh, that created all the different animals and then eventually you. No, before the foundations of the world, God knew that he was gonna make you. Not only did he know he was gonna make you, but he designed a plan for you. He gave you talents. He gave you desires and abilities. And the fun part of life, right, is finding out the things that you're good at doing, right? And then we've got a couple choices. Either we can use it for our own glory, or we can use our talents and abilities and everything we are for God. And when you do that, life is awesome. And the way we've got to show love to other people is not by condemning or trying to win an argument, but it's by loving people and saying, no, no, you're made in God's image. You mean so much more than what the world is telling you. I think that this is gonna become an issue more and more, and we see the battle coming together right now, especially in our country. And I think it's important that we as Christians are the salt and the light, and we just love people by pointing them back to the Creator again. Anyway, I just wanna close in prayer, and then I'll hand it back off to Mark. Father, thank you so much that you love us. Father, I thank you that you showed love for us so much that you created us in your image. God, help us to care about our fellow citizens so much that when they're being deceived by the enemy, that we care enough just to, uh, to speak up and say, no, 
You're a creature made in God's image. God, give us a, a compassion for those around us. And Father, when the enemy comes in to deceive, to turn people against people, uh, God, I pray that you would help us to see the truth. God, help us to understand that it's a spiritual battle. So Father, I pray for all of us uh, uh, in the Design Science Association, anybody who's tuning into this, God, help us to pray for opportunities to, uh, to love on people by showing them that they're created in, in your image, Father. We just pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Pat, very much. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. I just wanted to mention that we are hoping to resume our physical in-person meetings very, very soon, hoping to, and that you will be notified by our email newsletter. Again, if you are not receiving that newsletter, please email us at designscienceassociation at gmail.com. Get on our mailing list and you'll know when we are meeting again, hopefully very soon. And also soon, please check our creationencounter.com website. That's a team part of DSA that plans great hikes out to the gorge and different places, studying geology and even an occasional four or five nights.